Well, hi everybody, my name is Jennifer Madrill and today is Thursday, February 8th, 2018. And this is one of our designer dialogue informal meetups. So we have these every the second Thursday of every month and their sole purpose is just for people who are engaged in one of our classes. Right now we happen to have three classes going on. We've got our mobile learning design sprint. We have a design in the open challenge which just started in January. It's quite a lot of fun. And then the third is our instructional design service course that's focused on evaluation and redesign of the resources we have out on OER Commons. And FYI, the last time I checked over uh, about a week ago, we've got 122 lesson plans that have been developed by our volunteers over the last couple of years. So that's just awesome. Those are sitting out there on OER Commons. Uh, Creative Commons license so um, ed adult educators can come on and take a look if they're looking for some ideas for a lesson. Um, all different types are up there. Interview skills, um, using actually some of the mobile design sprint folks have been taking some of the lessons and adapting them and thinking about ways that they can use off the shelf mobile applications. Um, so it might be a record, the recording feature on your phone or maybe even using an app such as um, the dictionary or something like that. And again, all just like great little um, helps uh, to help those great educators that are out there teaching in adult education courses. Um, so with that, um, it'd be great if you kind of went around the horn if anybody wants to chime in and introduce themselves. Um, we've got JR, who's a facilitator in one of our courses. Do you want to kick us off, JR? Sure. Uh, my name is JR Dingwall. I'm an instructional designer at the Distance Education Unit at the University of Saskatchewan. So almost geographically center of, of Canada and about a six hour drive north of the border. Um, most of the work that I do is uh, supporting the entire university uh, for undergraduate and graduate program courses. Um, but I've been a designer and a facilitator with the service learning MOOC for a is it two years now? It's oh, been a gosh, while. I think it started, I think, did we start the fall of 2015 designing that first one, I believe, right? I think, yeah, I think it was 2015. So yeah. it's, it's been a, a little while and it's always really nice to see all the different projects that everyone's coming up with. So I'm the facilitator for the month of February. So if you're in that course, you'll see me popping in and out of the discussion forums. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, JR. We can't, can't thank you enough, really, truly. Um, and we, you and I met in person, oh gosh, that's now probably what, 2014 maybe? Or was it even 13? I don't remember. When I went up to um, your summer retreat offsite, that was... Uh, that was so I think fun. that was 14. That 14? But don't quote me on that. I, you know, time <laughs> flies. It feels like it was like six months ago. <laughs> and then, I don't know, Stephanie or um, Trapito, you want to say hi or you got your mic on? Uh, hi everyone. Um, oh, hi Stephanie. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi. Um, uh, I'm an instructional designer who's uh, who's currently on, um, you know, a maternity leave, so to speak. Um, uh, uh, I joined this MOOC uh, a few months ago, and I just completed the mobile learning design sprint. And I'm hoping to find a job in instructional design in the next few months. That's great. That's great. Yeah, That's I live awesome. in Arizona. Oh, you're in Arizona. Oh, I'm going to be yeah. in Phoenix. Uh, I'm going to the co conference. It's the um, Conference for Adult um, Basic Education. So I'll be in Phoenix. So. Oh, okay, great. In your neighborhood. <laughs> so. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and Stephanie? Um, so I'm... I'm in my master's program right now doing instructional design. So I signed up to start taking it, but then I got really overwhelmed with the schoolwork. So I was like, okay, let me just try to chime in and listen in. Um, I'm going to WGU. It's in Utah, but I currently live in Houston right now, but I'm hoping to go back to Utah soon. So, oh, that's yeah. right. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and no problem. Uh, we hear that a lot. And actually, that's something I wanted to talk about once we um, have a lull in the conversation. Uh, as you, the two of you mentioned, we and, and JR mentioned, we originally designed our service learning experiences as service MOOCs, so massive open online courses for those that haven't heard that term before. And um, we run them much like a semester long course in graduate school. And that's the plus in one aspect. And then unfortunately for those like uh, Stephanie, you just mentioned, it's a big lift for people who are um, going to school full time, possibly working, and then also have family obligations. And so one of the things we'll talk about is a different crowdsourcing approach that we're, we're putting uh, our, our thoughts into pulling together um, some folks to help us think through ways that we can 
um, make it where people are able to jump in and engage in smaller chunks on a, on a design project. So maybe it might be um, if you're interested in, um, for example, starting us out by getting a storyboard going and then somebody wanted to put a prototype together, like there's different handoffs to do that rather than do the whole thing from, from beginning to end. Um, but maybe a great place to jump in is, um, as you said, Charmaine, so you said you finished your sure. sprint. You want to yeah. give us a little overview of what you did and, um, and, and, and give us a sense for how you, I think you adapted an existing lesson, right, to make it uh, appropriate for a mobile application, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so um, I adapted this lesson called Introduction to Financial Accounting. Um, and um, uh, I, the learner persona that I chose was, uh, I think, Mayor, uh, okay, forget her name, actually, but yeah. Sorry about that, but um, so the uh, the solution that I came up with um, uh, was this uh, blogging tool called Padlet, and uh, I came up with exercises um, that involved the following: uh, you know, students introducing themselves at the beginning of the course, and then recording their personal goals, and also reviewing what they learned um, at the end of each module. So these were the mobile learning interventions that I designed. Um, yeah, and I enjoyed the whole process. I really liked um, developing it using the uh, agile process, um, um, uh, especially during during the user testing phase. Um, uh, it was a great learning experience. Uh, my key takeaway is that while conducting this user test, it's best to do it face to face instead of virtual because I initially did it virtually, and I found that people, um, um, the people taking the user test, they found it difficult to understand the instructions. Whereas when I explained it to them face to face, you know, showed them what I was doing and what they had to do, and they found it much easier to understand. So that that was a big takeaway for me. And also, um, you need to keep in mind the operating system um, that your users are using. Uh, so a Apple users found it easy to use Padlet, whereas Android users had a bit of a problem. So I had to tweak my instructions uh, so, that the, uh, so that they knew what they had to do uh, with the Padlet tool. Yeah, so these are some of my takeaways. And yeah, I just enjoyed the whole um, experience as such. Um, uh, I liked learning about uh, some of the instructional theories. Like I don't have a degree in instructional design. So, um, uh, it was interesting to learn about uh, Merrill's first principles of instruction and the Wippia uh, um, model and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You bring up so many um, great points. And for those that aren't familiar with the mobile learning design sprint, it is one of our means of fundraising within Designers for Learning. So unlike our free courses, um, we charge a modest $20, $20. To, um, to sign up for the course. And um, so I can give, I'll put the link in the chat room in a moment on, on how to poke around and look at it if you might be interested. But um, as um, Charmista uh, mentioned, we run it um, the, using a, a model, a design sprint formula that actually comes to us from Google Ventures. And so when they're looking at ways to innovate, they have um, a process and they actually run it as face-to-face -face over five days. Well, we've changed that up because we're a virtual um, experience, virtual organization. So we cut, it, cut those same five days into five phases. And um, I'll see if I can, how well I can do off the top of my head. You may have to jump in and help me. So there's a, the, the process of ideation, right? Where you're kind of coming up with, well, first of all, naming your problem and your need, what it is you're working yes. on. Uh, ideation on some, some um, ideas of what, um, what you could come up with. There's the storyboarding process um, where you're coming up with um, and kind of outlining what the, the learner's experience will be like in the, in the intervention that you're designing. Um, putting together uh, kind of a minimum viable uh, prototype and then using that prototype, as um, Shamista mentioned, in an actual um, uh, test with users. And one of the principles we, we've kind of honed in on in the course is that you don't need to do that with a lot of people. What ends up happening is when you do your, pro, um, your evaluation, with multiple people, they tend to keep finding the same mistakes, or not mistakes, uh, well, I guess it could be a mistake, but it could also be um, things that would enhance the experience um, that you hadn't thought about. And um, so what their, their recommendation is, is to instead, you pick two or three people, it's kind of three to five is actually kind of the sweet spot, but for what we're doing in our course, we're saying like a couple people, and then repeat it. So make the changes that they recommend um, and make a new um, iteration of your prototype. And then if you have the time, go out with a different group and, and, and try that. 
And so it's interesting to say, could you, could you kind of walk us through how that went with um, that process? What did, what were some of the feedback that you received that you wouldn't have had had you not done that process of, of having reviewers evaluate your work? Uh, for one thing, um, like I mentioned, Android users had a bit of a problem uh, using this tool that, uh, you know, the, the mobile learning solution that I de developed using that tool. Um, now what happens is, um, um, in Android, you have a back button uh, on top of the screen and at the bottom of the screen. So very often, um, now I had sent my users a link from, uh, um, uh, you know, from, uh, from the email, uh, like I sent them an email with the link to my mobile learning prototype. So they were accessing uh, the link from their email. So the minute they press the back button, it wouldn't take them to the home page. It would take them back to the email. You know, so, and this was a problem only in Android. It wasn't a problem in Apple. So um, I had to, um, you know, then figure out how to, you know, solve this problem. They just had to press the back button, um, I think, in, on their phone and not on the screen. You know, so I, I had to mention that uh, in the instructions. I had to add that. And once that was added, um, it was fine. Yeah, so um, small things like these. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. So in the class, to put the class together, I actually went through and did the process myself. And I took in one of our lessons and added a portion where it's the interview skills lesson. And I wanted people to use, try using the recording feature on their phone to record their answers to an interview prompt. So you can kind of hear yourself back and hear how you sound. Are you answering the question as it was asked? Those types of things. And so I had my husband, I just had one person, my husband, try it. But what I noticed is um, I had given instructions based on me using the recording app multiple times. And, and so obviously when he uses it for the first time, he was seeing different prompts. It was asking, for example, where do you want to save the recording or, you know, stuff that I had answered before. And so it was great to then go, oh yeah, I've got to go back and kind of uninstall this app and think about it from the standpoint of someone who's never used it. So that's just like a one example, um, you know, as you said, that can completely completely throw the experience for the learner if they can't even um, get started where you wanted them to. Well, that's awesome. That's yeah, and also one more thing I noticed is that, you know, people who were tech savvy uh, uh, amongst the people who took the user test, they were able to, even though they found certain things difficult, they were able to, you know, make their way through it and, you know, complete the user test. Whereas some people were just overwhelmed by all the instructions mm. I had written down, you know, because it, I was doing this virtually, so I, I had to give them written instructions and, um, you just got overwhelmed. Yeah, that's, that's my, I, I tend to over -ex explain. And so, yeah, exactly. Sometimes I lose them at the instructions. I can appreciate that. And Shay, I think, were you talking to me um, way back when? That, didn't you say that you used the design sprint in a work, for a work purpose once? Is that you? Um, something, well, there was like a, uh, from BC campus, there was a textbook sprint. So it happened over kind of four, four days. Mm -hmm. And I think they had about five or seven faculty members and an instructional designer, a librarian, and they all kind of descended into a room and, and wrote a textbook in a day. Um, as I was flipping through the course again, uh, at the start of this month, I ran into that, uh, whiteboard, uh, picture that I had with the, um, yes, with yes, an instructor right. that I, I yep. had worked with. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of like took me back to that moment of like, oh yeah, sometimes I just need to like throw up a whole bunch of ideas onto that board. And we really only used about 25% of what landed on that board, but then it really helped in the planning process. So yeah. in terms of sprint, it was more of like a, here's a three hour jam on whatever we're going to be working on. And then we can get going on the rest of the project. Yeah, and I think that's kind of that, um, the unique aspect of the ideation piece of it uh, within the sprint. I just put a link in the chat room, actually two links. The first link is how you can find those the two courses I mentioned, the four, four fee courses, the design in the open and the mobile sprint are in there. And then also the second um, link that I just put in the chat room is for the um, Google Ventures book. Um, and then it's also a website that if you don't want to buy the book, it will give it just a kind of a high level overview of, um, of what the process is all about. And I guess what I like about it, it's like you said, um, well, that's a pretty big luxury, though, for any job to be able to set aside four days to, to go pound out and think, think through some design concept. But 
Um, also, at the same time, it sometimes it takes that to be able to throw out all the potential ideas. Is um, what J.I. was explaining is in our um, course we have an image. He took a photo of a whiteboard after he and a colleague, I think it was a colleague, right, had sat there and, and just threw out all different types of ideas and their arrows and and the whole thing. And um, as we were saying, that's kind of part of that ideation process of throwing out kind of anything you can come up with and trying to link concepts and link the flow of how a course could could go, um, which is, is kind of refreshing from, from some of the other approaches that we sometimes take. It's a little more regimented. So. Um, and then I think, is there someone calling in? I don't know, was it Ruth maybe? If, I don't know if Ruth, you wanted to say hi, or if you can. I think it's Ruth, I'm assuming it is, because I think she went out and back in again. Feel free. Maybe she doesn't have her audio set up. So okay, that's great. Well, Stephanie, did you? I don't know. I had a couple questions for you. Um, if you're if you're still, um, unless you're just listening and you don't have your audio. Um, so what are your thoughts on? Um, have you had any chance to look at the course at all, or um, what? What do you think you might try to sink sink your teeth into once you get going? Um, no, I haven't been able to look at any of the courses just yet. It's been really overwhelmed. With yeah, no problem. No problem. I'm glad you're trying and see like what I can you know grab some knowledge or see what's all happening right now in the field of ID work so oh, that's great that's great um and I don't know JR did you have any you've I know you've only been in the class for like a week now but any thoughts of, of like what you're seeing or um and again kind of putting you on the spot here with a week well, over <laughs> I think so far, like one one came in that uh, the note had said that it can be used face to face or in a blended or um, in an e-learning sort of sort of style. So that was something I remember back at, for the very first ones. We were very kind of um, document driven, and that uh, there was kind of teacher packages uh, were almost what the lesson plans were like. And so it was kind of neat to then see after this is what the fourth time the course is offered or something like that. Um, and that it's, you know, it's in that revision stage. So now I'm starting to actually see it's like, oh, it's not just this initial design and development, but now there's this extra layer on it. And they had built a small web page. So you could go to OER Commons or link out to this web page and um, kind of building on it that way. So yeah. I thought that was pretty interesting. I'm kind of looking forward to um, the other projects that trickle in uh, over the next couple of weeks to see see if I recognize any of the lessons from, from yeah. previous times or in new forms or if they've been added to or if they are brand new ones. Yeah, and what Jair's uh, referring to is, like you said, the first class we had was a, a just a pure instructional design um, experience. And then after we got about 60 or 70 lessons in, we thought, well, you know what, we probably should spend some time evaluating this. But rather than making people who are really interested in the design experience exclusively do an evaluation, we kind of turned it on its head a little bit and um, used a concept called developmental evaluation. And so the idea is you do go through those early stages of, of design, thinking about the learner and the need and the context, doing a bit of an analysis. So your head is in the game in terms of understanding what, what it is that you're working on. And then thinking about it in terms of um, how could I take this lesson and not necessarily in a negative connotation of, of like changing or changing problems or making corrections, but more thinking about it in terms of, wow, you know what, I think this lesson would be completely different if I looked at it in a rural context, or if I looked at it with uh, maybe an older audience, like maybe this is a lesson that was designed for um, you know, 18 to 24 year olds, but wow, what if this is somebody like, a, it's a digital literacy class, and it might be for um, at a senior center, senior citizen center or something like that. So whatever it is that inspires you to think about, or maybe it's a context you might be working in, to take that lesson and think through um, on how to change it. And again, putting JR on the spot a little bit, he was just telling us before I turned the recording on that he's now working um, largely in a distance education, online learning, and in some cases, correspondence um, capacity. But but yeah, like, kind of, why don't you throw it for those that are just signing in or joining in to think about design in, in general? Like, how does that, the difference, like, as I was mentioning, changing our, one of our lessons based on context, like, how does that affect you as a designer when you're thinking about a lesson that's already been done and now you're thinking about how, we, how you're going to have to change it? Um, certainly the, the most common experience, uh, I have is I'll, I'll sit down with an instructor and they currently already teach their 
classes and lessons face to face. And all of a sudden we're stripping away all of that to an asynchronous course. So there's no webinars, there's no kind of nothing's happening at the same time usually. And so how do you then use this lesson plan when you don't have the same uh, space or the same temporal space or like you're not there at the same time? And uh, how do you give that feeling of there are other people in this course? Um, and so some of the things that we end up uh, implementing are uh, learning activities throughout the content where it's kind of like a drive-by activity, I call them sometimes, where as I am the learner going through the material, I can see responses of other people from the class and that it's not a traditional discussion forum, but it's something that's really short and snappy, just like somebody had put up their hand in class um, or uh, responded to a, a prompt from the instructor. So all of a sudden there's, you know, digital post-it notes in the middle of the learning content that I know came from other students in the class. That's awesome. Um, so those kinds of conversions are, are interesting. Um, if it's kind of like a televised course, then that puts a whole other kind of spin on it because maybe I have, uh, do I have pods of students uh, distributed across the, the region or do I have a bunch of people sitting alone in a room in their house distributed? Do I have a pod and then a bunch of districts? So you really have to ask all those kinds of questions and then uh, the influence that that has is, is quite different. Um, I really appreciate that uh, iOS versus Android thing because in the online world, I, I run into that pretty, pretty regularly. Yeah. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Even just even Mac Windows, right? Just the old uh, the de the laptop desktop uh, issues as well. Um, well, I, I want to keep open the floor if anybody has any questions about anything. Um, I do. I was just going to conclude before we wrap up with kind of giving you an, a hint, some hints at some things that are we're working on first, probably starting in the summer and going into the fall. But I definitely want to just open the floor if anybody has anything they'd like to talk about. You can always just jump in, feel free. <laughs> All right, well, feel free to also type something in the text chat if, if something um, pops in, in, your, in your mind. So as I mentioned, when Stephanie was logging on, we completely appreciate um, her, her predicament that it's, it's hard to jump into our courses, especially the, um, the original MOOCs. They were, most students who complete the course say it takes them between 25 and 40 hours. Some have even said longer, which is a little frightening, um, but it's great. And I'm not, they didn't even, those that actually said that it took them longer, it wasn't necessarily a negative thing. And a lot of them that they could also have been including, they were learning the subject matter as well um, uh, as, as designing at the same time. Um, but as I mentioned, when we logged on, what we're really focusing on when we did the surveys in the, those courses, we also asked people how much time they had to commit to the course each week. And people were telling us like an hour or two, and so clearly if they're spending 40 hours on a course, it's supposed to be about a six weeks-ish experience where we're really overshooting the mark on the majority of the people who sign up. And so um, we're looking at ways to revamp our crowdsourcing approach. approach. And so we're, we haven't really come up with a team. What we're probably gonna do, like, much like we did as JR mentioned um, back in 2015, We'll be assembling a team of folks to help us think what's this going to look like, how will we, all the things kind of really that JR just mentioned, what, what, who are these uh, service learners and MOOC participants now, how will we accommodate them under this new way of doing things in, this, in a different, different world. But to give you a sense of what the design project will be about. We definitely, as an organization, nonprofit, as a nonprofit, um, we're, we have a charitable mission and our focus is very much on adult literacy. And so we joined the Chicago Literacy Alliance in the fall of 2017. We're one of 30 member organizations here in Chicago, um, all working on literacy related issues that affect um, from children all the way up through adults. And um, so there's three main areas where we think we can add value as an organization. One, we hear over and over from nonprofits that they need basic reading resources um, for, for adults who are learning to read. So if you can imagine when you either were a child or you're raising your children, the types of materials you use with them, it's very much in a context appropriate for a kid. And so that, for very obvious reasons, is offensive to an adult when you're presented with a text that 
is clearly written for an eight-year-old and you're 58 or 38. Um, so not only is it just like, you know, kind of like an awkward thing to make someone sit down and read something like that, it also isn't really covering content that's appropriate for an adult. So most of these adults that are in adult education programs are really there to improve their lives from um, a work standpoint. So um, they're looking for exposure on how to do, um, we mentioned already interviews or how to um, prepare a resume or what it's like to um, go to the bank, for example, if it's, uh, uh, if it's like an English as a second language course and it's maybe a new immigrant to the United States or wherever and they're not familiar with, um, you know, a custom uh, in the United States, whatever it may be. So what we'd like to do is assemble um, a platform that will allow us to have people submit short readings that they've written or curated. Um, so it may be something like, uh, if it's something to do with financial literacy. So maybe you want to write a 600 word description of what is involved in opening a checking account, let's say as an example. And so you might take the first stab and we have, if you're familiar with how uh, literacy is evaluated in terms of reading skills with various lexiles. And so maybe we'd like you to write um, this essay at um, the equivalent of like a third grade level. And so go through that process and write it. And then, so if someone would take some amount of time, probably a couple, two hours, three hours to write something, then there'd be someone who'd come along and uh, sign up or raise their hand that they would take on the job of um, reading it, QCing it, double checking the Lexile level. And then maybe if you're so inclined and want to test your skills in terms of message design and um, putting together some types of images or graphics that may be appropriate. Um, pick that up on a Saturday afternoon and pound away and, and make something. Or as we said, we're all also very big of taking an initial, initial resource and tweaking it for a different context. And so maybe you're like, oh, that's a really good article. And I think if I just pivot a little bit, instead of going to the bank for the first time, um, just to open a checking account, it might be I'm trying, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, what's something else you do as an adult? <laughs> um, whatever, maybe re register your kids for school. And so, um, you know, kind of generally what you can expect when you go to the school and you start uh, walking to the office, the types of paperwork you might need to take about your child when you go to register them for their first day of school. Um, and so those are really in high, high demand by our adult educators. And so our vision is these would be written pretty simply in a Google Doc. Um, for a lot of reasons. For one thing, it's easy to edit and share. It's also, there's um, add-ons to, to do translations pretty easy. So if you want to translate them into other languages. Um, also, most of our platforms, we also work with, for example, OER Commons. By a push of a button, we can push that out to them and then that would reside out there for people to, to look at. Um, so that's one thing. So the, that's our adult literacy library. And we're, we'll be working on that in the summer and the fall. The second thing is we hear a lot from educators that even though the stuff we've worked on is great, um, they say this very politely, we very much focus things on lesson plans. And most educators, as we're learning, who work in adult education programs, about 70% of them are part-time working, they're paid part-time workers, uh, teachers, and then another 15% are volunteers. And so these are people who are screeching in, you know, four minutes before the class starts to work with their adult students, and they just want their activities. They're the activities that they're going to work on that night with their students, not all this preamble that we give them and like the, how long things will be. They just want to kind of cut to the chase. So we, in our world, we would kind of refer to that more as like micro learning, where it really focuses on lots of practice act, um, activities and with opportunities for, for feedback. So it may be as simple as worksheets. Um, it may be some of the mobile applications we had. So the teacher just says to everybody in the room, okay, who's got a, a smartphone? Okay, you three do. Why don't you scooch together and work on, on this? Uh, it may be something like that. So it's just a real quick, you know, short little lesson that will cover some some type of skill and competency that, um, that is important. And we're gonna have our, our subject matter experts help us come up with topics and, and competencies and skills so we can kind of rank those out in terms of what people are looking for. Then the third thing is much more complex, and this is so fuzzy in my head, it's really hard for me to explain, but 
Um, as most people, especially in the United States and, and North America know, um, the primary way for adults to achieve high school equivalency prior to 2013, let's say, was the GED test. There are now multiple tests, there are three different tests, but in some places that's even kind of going out of favor saying, okay, I have this, this certificate that says I passed this test, but it's really not doing anything necessarily to help me get a job. Um, there's still skills that I need as an adult to um, be able to pursue a job, workforce development type skills that I, I need. And so um, a lot of uh, programs now are, and, and states are pushing forward this idea of competency-based high schools for adults and um, competency-based uh, programs. And so, we think it would be really nice for Designers for Learning, given the mission of our organization, is to be able to work with folks on developing what that curriculum might look like. So these would be um, more macro performance-based um, activities and, um, and lessons that they would do. So those are kind of the three areas that right now we're, we're carving out as silos that we want to work on. But most definitely the first the, the literacy library, continuing to work on micro learning lessons, which probably will be mainly just like a pivot of what we're doing currently and just kind of reconceptualizing what that deliverable would look like. And then the third bucket is, is as I said, it's still so fuzzy in my head. I really can't um, articulate very well right now with what that will look like. But JR, you kind of been with us from the beginning. So after that long 10 minute <laughs> overview, like what are your thoughts on this? You talked to a lot of our adult educators and, and you You've certainly worked with many up in, in Canada. What do you what do you think about that? I think um, the the first the first of those three things that you mentioned really grabbed me. That the whole resources reading resources because um, this has actually come up uh, um, quite a bit uh, in terms of OER in general. Is that uh, there's a lot of focus on better search engines or bigger repositories and and all of those kinds of things when really there is still just such limited amount of materials that, that we can get our hands on. So no matter how good my search engine is, it's not going to help me if, if there's nothing for this specific reading level uh, in this kind of content area. So uh, that one really kind of grabs my attention and, and looks interesting to me. Um, the activity piece, yeah, like uh, I know our, our lesson plans are, are quite thorough. Um, <laughs> quite thorough. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think in a way that you know it, it's kind of necessary and now with those lesson plans then it would be um, this this evolution from developing that full lesson plan to slowly like evaluating that or kind of adapting that is now I think uh, a perfect opportunity to start swapping in and out those activities or swapping in and out those reading resources so yeah. um, but again if those 120 lesson plans weren't there then uh, what what else are you going to swap that activity into or out of? Yeah, and, and certainly not at all to say we're going to throw the baby out of the bathwater here with our lesson plans. If you read through the lesson plans, it's kind of what we consider like the guts of the lesson. It's like the second, the first part is kind of the descriptor, who the audience is, what the objectives are. And so we never really intended that for be nothing that the learner would ever see. This is, again, is more of an indexing for um, a teacher who's doing a scan of lessons to go, okay, this is what I'm looking for. Um, and that second part, as JR mentioned, like that is really if we can figure out ways to strip that out and get right to the heart of what the lesson is. And so a teacher can go, okay, so now this is, these are the resources I need. I need a, somehow how to get my hands on a bunch of Blackboard, which by the way, um, I've, I've toured, I've been fortunate to go on a lot of um, site visits in my time now in Chicago. And everything we've heard over the years from our subject matter experts is definitely what I'm seeing here in Chicago. Maybe two or three computers in a big, loud, crowded room, if you're lucky. Most teachers don't have their own classroom, so they're just, as I said, you know, scurrying into the room a few minutes before, so there's certainly not a lot of time to prep a classroom with, um, you know, like most teachers who, K-12, you think of them having their own classroom where different they know where everything is and they can reach it in a second um, and so those contextual issues for a teacher um, and how students are learning are all things we need is to think about as designers so we can just hand off um, these lessons so they can just jump right in so 
I feel like I've just talked way more than I wanted, but go ahead. I think someone was going to say something. Go ahead. It's me, Jennifer Sharmishta. Um, so are you looking to, uh, you know, develop these course plans into proper lessons? I know you said something about micro learning, but uh, I imagine we need to, uh, you need to come up with something like uh, facilitator guides uh, for these teachers. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, yeah, because I looked at that uh, financial accounting uh, lesson and I guess it was more of an overall strategy and uh, didn't get into specifics. So uh, I imagine the other lessons are like that too. So, uh. Yeah, and, and it's funny, um, when you look through the lessons that are there, as you said, I think some of them are almost looking at the, this is like a semester long or multiple times to have the learner. And so, you know, some of the ones may be a little you know, too, too, too far. So I think kind of going back to really our roots, what we were doing probably when JR and I first started conceptualizing what we wanted to do, we originally were thinking about time on task of like 15 to 20 minutes for a student. And we got a lot of pushback in certain pockets. Like some were like, yep, that's exactly what we want. We want like, you know, so I can sit down and, and do something quickly with my, my learners. And then we did get a lot of pushback in, uh, in other areas saying, no, we need it to be more comprehensive, something you work on during the hour where it has like a flow, a beginning, middle, and an end. And so I think maybe, we, maybe that's what it's going to be. Maybe we'll have to have a little bit of both. But um, I think where we definitely don't want to do what, kind of getting to your point as far as like a design guide and, and things is it, they, they aren't looking for a full curriculum. So they're not looking for how am I going to take a learner who's learning math starting with addition and then like, okay, now I need to quickly backfill, not quickly, but like I need to then have a lesson on, you know, fractions and how to add fractions and multiply. It, those things all probably are needed, but they're not looking for a full roster. <laughs> they're looking almost like you think of when you're when you're sitting down to cook dinner or something and you're like, it tells me I need to mince garlic. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so I need to go to YouTube and watch someone mince garlic for me. So like that's kind of the way they describe what they're looking for is I, you know, I need a quick exercise to show how to add fractions. I don't need all the theoretical math concepts that would come with that. I just need some worksheets. So I can practice with my students on that. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, in fact, um, in our last uh, um, designer dialogues we had, we had a woman who was a teacher at one point in um, English as a second language, and she referred to it as survival English. So um, they would say, for example, this weekend, take yourself to such and such a place using the bus. And think through all of the ways you need to re be able to read a schedule for the bus and you know street addresses and those types of things. And so then those became the words and the concepts that they, they focused on in the lesson. So it's just kind of a different way to approach, you know, things than we probably have been thinking about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And JR, I don't know, am I explaining this right? I mean, you've kind of been there from the beginning as far as trying to make the transition from those of us that are more aware of K-12 or higher ed to this kind of new context. Yeah, I think that like, that I remember some of those conversations about the 15 minute lesson plan and, <laughs> and yeah. it's, oh, I need an hour and I need, um, and it, it, from my understanding, like because I haven't worked in the adult basic education uh, sector in the United States like it was new to me at that time so it was really interesting to hear about all of the different contexts you know some of our other designers or subject matter experts um, were in such vastly different contexts that yeah. it, things that um, I know that I took uh, for granted things like the computers in the lab or a projector and it's like no it's like don't have any of that now what can I do for a lesson plan or uh, one of the early personas I think uh, was an inmate and so it's like well it's like now there's a, this other whole set of restrictions um, so it, it's really tough to get that one size fits all kind of assignment design mm -hmm. um, but yeah like those those 15 to 30 minutes like I think about um, even when I go into or when I used to substitute teach in k-12 it was like oh I just need the I know the conceptual math pieces I know about fractions and I can explain that but coming up with examples and exercises off the top of my head is not yeah. going to happen in front of 20 people. Yeah, um, right. So really, you know, from, from that experience as a, a teacher, and again, in a, in a different context was still, 
I need kind of those supporting resources and then I can stitch those together with that lived experience within the classroom. Yeah. Well, one of our, uh, on one of my visits, the instructor showed me one of her most successful lessons that she's pretty proud that she developed. And it's, I called it genius, but she found a high interest video. Um, I, I don't remember the topic. Um, it was fairly short. It looked like it was about three to five minute video on YouTube. And then she printed out the transcript. And so she used, it was an English as a second language course. And so they were used, she pulled out some of the words within the transcript as vocabulary they worked on. And, and then she said that light bulbs that went off when then they're reading the transcript or watching the video. And then, then they realized they know the words that then are, were said. It was, she said it was just really a powerful, and that's just one example of a, that would be a very short exercise that you could do. Um, I mean, you could stretch it out certainly, but if you wanted to work on vocabulary, um, kind of the kind of comprehension of like what, what's, if you, as you're reading it, what is it saying? And then how it's different when you hear it. And it was just, she said it was just a really, Fun and actually something you can replicate pretty easy, um, you know, pivot and look at a different type of topic. So, but that was one example, like you said, she, <laughs> when you go into a classroom, I just need something to, well, I got to do something with these folks for the next 20 minutes. What are we going to do? So. All right. Well, I don't want to keep everybody and just babble, although, as you know, I can do that. So, um, but I do also want to kind of give everybody, you know, stick around. So we're kind of in a, in a rut right now. It feels like to me anyway, we haven't introduced a new course since January. So <laughs> it's been a full like six weeks since we haven't introduced a new course, but um, um, we're going to be definitely um, working on a lot this, this summer and fall. Great. Anything else? Well, I thank everybody for volunteering with us and lurking. Lurking is fine because that day will come when you have time. So thanks, everybody. Have a really great week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay.